This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I right. Right. And I was so And I just thought, well, I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Aditi Nadkarni. The story was recorded in July 2013 at Union Hall in Brooklyn. The theme of the night was Close to Death. Before I tell you the incident that I'm going to describe today, let me tell you a little about myself so it would help to know why this sort of shit happens to me. <laughs> so, um, it, if you haven't noticed, I'm Indian. That's, that's part of the explanation. But um, also, you know, being an Indian, you have 1.5 billion people who are very willing to replace you if you <laughs> don't prove your worth, and so that makes all of us very competitive. Sometimes in situations where you don't need to be competitive. Uh, like for example, I'll very rarely go to the gym, but when I do, I'm always like on the elliptical looking over my shoulder at the level that the other person is on, and then I'll go one level up. <laughs> it helps if they're old and unfit, so that's it. Uh, so this used to be much worse about 10 years ago when I was a graduate student, and I was fresh off the boat from India. I didn't know a whole lot about working in a research lab, and I had just joined this very competitive lab. Um, and I was, you know, uh, I wanted to prove a point. I wanted to show everybody that, hey, you know, I deserve this. I deserve to be part of this lab. And this was not easy, because there was a senior graduate student. His name, from now on, I will refer to him as The Phil. <laughs> Phil the Great was quite a bit of competition. He was a senior graduate student. He had identified uh, a gene, a new gene, and he had characterized its function. Uh, it basically means it was a big deal. And he had just been interviewed. The week that I got accepted into this lab, he had just uh, been interviewed by Toledo Blade. Um, it was Toledo, Ohio. And Toledo Blade is a big thing in Toledo, Ohio. Just take my word for it. <laughs> so he was interviewed by the Toledo Blade. And uh, <laughs> you know, the Phil was uh, the talk of the town. Everybody at University of Toledo was like, oh my god, the Phil got into you know, the newspaper. I wanted to be in the newspaper. I was a fresh you know, graduate student. And I didn't know anything, but I still wanted to you know, be famous and be known. And I was just this newbie, and everybody was just trying to get me out of the way or watching over my shoulder, making sure I wasn't, like, electrocuting myself or something. <laughs> so one day, I decided I'm going to do something. You know, I have to, like, you know, start my own project. And so I decided I'm going to take the gene that Phil made and make a mutation in it and then see what happens to that gene. It's the elliptical all over again. And I just, you know, won up. So. I decided, okay, and you know, if you tell somebody who has even a year of experience working in a genetics lab, they'll say, oh, that's easy, like, you know, take some genetic material, draw on a PCR, make a mutation. But to a fresh graduate student, this seemed like a, you know, a big thing, like it was a big plan. Um, I thought I was a genius to have come up with it. <laughs> but I wanted to keep this whole thing a secret. So I started working after hours, which is like after six. Everybody used to be gone and stuff. But I was very excited about this project. Now, when this particular incident happened, that was the day that it was a pretty big milestone for my experiment. I knew I had gotten the mutation, but I needed to check it. And in order to check it, I had to put it into bacteria, and then take those bacteria and grow them on plates. Now, if the mutation was there, the bacteria would grow in colonies on the plate the next day. 
So all I needed to do, all that stood between me and that mutation was plating those things on the plate. And I was working after hours. It was about midnight. I hadn't eaten anything, you know, I was excited. And sometimes the excitement blends with the hypoglycemia. <laughs> it does, it really does. I mean, in science, it happens a lot. So, you know, I was uh, working and I was so excited. I forgot that, you know, all I'd had was cereal for breakfast and hadn't eaten anything. So in order to do this, what you do is you have a Bunsen burner, make sure it's sterile so that the other naughty bacteria don't grow on your plate instead of your bacteria. And you have this beaker of alcohol in which you dip the spreader. And then you run it through a flame. And then you spread your bacteria. Pretty simple, right? Well, I got everything started. I chose a nice area, you know, put a Bunsen burner, took my beaker. But I was hypoglycemic. And so instead of dipping the glass rod into the beaker of alcohol and flaming it, I flamed it and then dipped it into the alcohol. <laughs> and just like that, like one splinter of glass hit that beaker of alcohol, and it was a monstrous beaker. In hindsight, I don't know why I needed such a big beaker just to do <laughs> But, you know, I used a big beaker. It was suddenly in flames, and this big orange flame just was standing in front of me, and you know how there is this moment where you are like, I'm not a genius, I'm an idiot, just save me. <laughs> that was my moment. And uh, it was awful. Suddenly, I realized, you know, this was midnight, nobody's here, there's a beaker on fire, and I realized that I had not chosen a very good area to do this because there were electrical wires everywhere, and there was a live gas line. And there were papers hanging. It was a you know, very old biomedical lab. You have like papers hanging from everywhere. And then this big flame trying to like, you know, light everything up. So I, you know, in, if I were not hypoglycemic, maybe I would have like picked something heavy and you know, like a glass plate and put it on the beaker and it would have been gone. But I just couldn't think of anything. And I was so hungry that I was thinking of donuts and <laughs> I was thinking of the fire and I just didn't know what was going on. So, and I didn't want to die in a beaker fire. <laughs> Who wants that, right? But I couldn't just leave with a beaker on fire. So I went to the phone, the lab phone, and I dialed the emergency phone. And I can't remember what I said. There was like this flood of words. Um, in a very thick Indian accent. And I was like, oh, there's a beaker, it's on fire. And she said, oh, do you want me to call, call Code Orange? And I was like, well, I don't know what Code Orange is. I was like, okay, okay, fine. And my eyes were on the beaker, so I hung up and went to the beaker and started like moving papers away and moving the wires away. I tried touching the beaker, which was stupid. I burned my fingers. <laughs> And then I backed off because I realized how dangerous the situation was. And I don't know. It seemed like it must have been 20 seconds, but it was probably more than that. And suddenly, half a dozen firemen dressed in like complete gear. I mean, to somebody from India, they looked like astronauts. They were wearing masks and they had hoses and stuff. And there's a beaker with a fire. <laughs> And I was like, oh my god. And they were like, ma'am, we need you to get out of the way. And so I, you know, I tried to move, but I wanted to say, it's just a beaker fire. And, uh, but they were trying to ignore me, and I felt pretty stupid for having done this. So they were like, ma'am, ma'am, you need to get away. And what is, what are the contents of this beaker? And I don't know if you've noticed this, like law enforcement and people who are in control, they use this unnecessarily formal terminology. What are the contents of this beaker? And when somebody says that, you forget what's in the beaker. And so, <laughs> it happened to me. So I said something which was between ethanol and ethyl alcohol. And he looked at me stammering, and he's talking into this radio, and he goes, there is an unidentified chemical in the beaker. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, it's not, I will identify it. And at that point, they're just like shushing me and moving me away. And then they wear these thick gloves that they have, and they pick the beaker up, and they take it and put it in the middle of the hallway. And then they convene, and they're talking to each other what to do about this unidentified chemical on fire. 
And now that it's in the middle of the hallway, it looks like an aromatherapy candle. Because <laughs> there's nothing around it, it's not going to do anything. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, I'm okay now, I'm fine. And suddenly I'm like, oh, the glass cabinet, that's going to have the glass. So while these people, the officers are talking, <laughs> I go to the glass cabinet, take a glass plate, and I run and put it on the beaker and the fire is gone. <laughs> And the weaker, the fire, you know, the firemen are just like, oh, okay. <laughs> and there is this one guy who is with them, but he seems, you know, like he's dressed in pajamas. And he's like taking notes. I assumed it was a safety officer, you know. I mean, he's taking notes. He asked me, what's your name, ma'am? And I gave him my name. He wrote down the name of the lab and what were you working on? And so he wrote all that down. And just as soon as, you know, they had arrived, they were gone. I went into the coffee room and stole somebody's protein bar. <laughs> and then I felt better. I mean, not about stealing, but just having... <laughs> just having eaten, I felt better. And then I came back, and then again, I was in my mutant gene mode. So I did what I was supposed to do. I plated everything, put it into the incubator, and then went home. And I said to myself, you know, if there are colonies on the plate tomorrow, none of this shit is going to matter. I don't have to tell anybody about this. <laughs> I mean, why does anyone have to know about this? It, the fire is gone. Nobody died. So the next morning when I wake up, I'm all about the colonies, you know? I'm thinking, oh, do I have colonies? Maybe I have my mutant gene. So I go to lab, you know, really like excited. And on the way to the lab, I stop at the incubator and there were colonies, beautiful, sexy, fat, plump colonies. As far as colonies go, fat and plump is sexy. So then, and then as I'm going to my lab to announce to my boss that, you know, I did this, I see that there is this little uh, crowd of people gathered at the entrance of my lab. And I was like, maybe they saw the colonies too. Because at this point, I'm just thinking of my own genius, right? So I go and Doug is standing there, Doug, my advisor. And he is laughing so hard that he has tears coming down his eyes. <laughs> and I was like, maybe he's just happy that I got a mutant gene. <laughs> so he looks at me and I go, did you see them? And Doug goes, yes, I saw. And I was like, isn't it amazing? And he was like, really, why is it amazing? And uh, I look confused and I realize from the corner of my eye that there is this roll of paper that's being passed around and all these other people in a crowd and I start to figure out that maybe they're all not happy about my colonies. And so I look around and Doug goes, oh my God, she has no idea. And I was like, no idea about what? And he takes the newspaper and hands it to me. And among the headlines of the Toledo Blade, <laughs> It says, campus officer extinguishes beaker fire. <laughs> and I look at the article and I say to myself, I really hope my name isn't in there. And my name was in there. <laughs> and I was humiliated. And it said there that I was doing this at midnight. It explained exactly what I was doing. <laughs> And upon reading this, I had to save face. The competitive edge was still there. So I go, he did not extinguish it. I did. <laughs> I put the glass plate on it. They were just, they were talking about someone, and they just laughed. They laughed. They were like, Didi, it's not even about that. Your name is in the paper. <laughs> so I became pretty famous for this, right? Because, I mean, I set fire to a beaker. They invite, they named me Pyro Aditi. <laughs> that was my gangster name. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then uh, they invited me to the university's um, safety class. <laughs> I was a uh, keynote speaker at their safety class. <laughs> that was nice. I mean, that's pretty important, right? So anyways, but you know, there's a positive spin on this. The colonies that I told you about, that 
funded my grant and got me my PhD. So I mean, I deserved the PhD, you know, even though I set fire to a beaker. <laughs> but just for your entertainment, I'm going to tell you this. If you go to Toledo Blade website and you search my name, it comes up. <laughs> so have fun with that. Thanks. That was Aditi Nadkarni. Aditi is a New York-based cancer researcher and a freelance science and creative writer. Her occupations are a miscellany of creative pursuits. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. We have a special event coming up this Friday, August 2nd, at Rockefeller University. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel Shapiro. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Union Hall for hosting the show, and to the blackboards I used to use to do science for basically never catching fire. Thanks for listening. Everybody in your crew identifies as either Big Mac Burger, McNuggets, or McCrispy Sandwich. But you're the filet fish Sandwich all day. That crispy fish, that savory tartar sauce, that melty cheese, that pillowy bun. Yeah, you get it. Every time. And if you love the filet fish right now you can catch two of the classics you love for just $6. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.